It is a privilege and pleasure to introduce Dr. Bruce McCormick, the Charles Hodge Professor of Theology at Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, Professor McCormack did his undergrad studies at Point Loma College in San Diego, received his MDiv from Nazarene Theological Seminary in Kansas City, before going on to Princeton Theological Seminary where he obtained his PhD for his dissertation on Karl Barth, eventually published in 1995 as Karl Barth's Critically Realistic Dialectical Theology, its Genesis and Development. The book published by Oxford University Press, garnered honors both at home and abroad. In Germany, it was awarded the Karl Barth Prize in 1998 for establishing new standards for American and European Barth research. In 2005, he received an honorary doctorate from the Friedrich Schiller University in Germany. Usually the theological traffic goes the other way. And here in North America, Professor McCormack is perhaps best known for initiating an ongoing debate about the Trinity and election. Uh, he initiated that with his article, Grace and Being, the Role of God's Gracious Election in Karl Barth's Theological Ontology. Various rejoinders and surrejoinders to this seminal piece have now been published in a book, Trinity and Election in Contemporary Theology. 2011 has been a busy year for Professor McCormack. In the spring, he delivered the Kroll Lectures at the University of Edinburgh on the death of Christ in systematic and historical perspective. They got six lectures, we get seven. I've known Bruce for about 20 years since we overlapped at New College as colleagues, and I'll always be grateful for the pity he took on me and the time he took to explain the mysteries of Scottish university uh, life. But his real passion is for helping all Christians understand the mystery made known in Jesus Christ. And this brings us to the topic of his lectures, The God Who Graciously Elects. Bruce has been thinking about the God who elects for years, perhaps more consistently and deeply than any other recent theologian. It's a fitting topic for someone who I know to be a theologian's theologian one who seeks, above all, to submit his thinking about all things to God's revelation in Jesus Christ. I believe we're in for a seven-course theological feast. So please join me in welcoming our 2011 Concert Lecturer in Revealed Theology. I am uh, very grateful to have been invited to deliver the Kenneth Conser Lectures. I never knew Kenneth Conser personally, though I have known of him since my student days at Covenant Seminary in St. Louis, where I began my uh, MDiv education, only completing it in Kansas City. And I know personally members of his family quite well. His son Dick is an elder in our church in Princeton, and Dick's daughter, Han Luen, and her husband, David Comline, were students in a number of my MDiv courses at Princeton a few years ago before they began PhDs at Notre Dame. In any event, I consider it an honor to be associated with the name of, of a revered leader of the evangelical movement in this country like Kenneth Conser. I'd like to thank Tom McCall, Doug Sweeney, and Kevin Van Hooser for the kind invitation which has brought me here and the Carl F. H. Henry Center for Theological Understanding for sponsoring this event. The ecclesial and theological situation in this country is in rapid flux. The unchanging verities I took for granted as a grad student 30 years ago weren't so unchanging after all. The most conspicuous change is that Protestant denominationalism as we have known it in this country for well over 200 years is in rapid decline, and there does not appear to be anything that can prevent its demise apart from a great awakening. The so-called mainline denominations have, to varying degrees, paid lip service to their confessions for decades. What held them together in the meantime was largely a shared polity. But where polity is employed to force a resolution to hot-button ethical issues on which no theologically grounded agreement has been reached, 
The result will quite naturally be resentment and cynicism on the part of those whose beliefs have been simply bracketed off and treated as irrelevant to the church's future. Many congregations in the PC USA, the denominational sponsor of Princeton Seminary, have discontinued financial support of the national church, choosing instead to focus on the mission of their own body. And quite a few have removed the word Presbyterian from the signboards outside their church buildings, even though they remain nominally connected to the denomination. And so denominationalism is morphing before our eyes. Where this will all end is very hard to predict. New church formations, quite possibly, but ones with much looser structures of authority seem likely, which means that the Protestant churches will be more congregationally driven in the future than they have been in the past. With all of that has come changes in the theological landscape. When I was a grad student, the words liberal and evangelical had meanings you could more or less count on. The word liberal basically described a person with what we called at the time a low Christology and what we evangelicals considered a low view of the authority of Scripture. But classical liberalism at least had a Christology. Indeed, in most of its manifestations, classical liberal theology was Christocentric. One need think here only of Friedrich Schleiermacher, Albrecht Ritschel, and Adolf von Harnack to realize just how Christocentric liberal theology could be. To be sure, there were those who also relativized God's self-revelation in Christ. A post-Christian theologian like David Friedrich Strauss comes immediately to mind. <clears throat> Ernst Trouch and the History of Religions School also contributed to a shift from the Christocentric to a rather vague theocentrism in the early decades of the 20th century. Today, however, the question for a good many liberals in this country is whether Jesus of Nazareth should have anything to do with Christology at all. With the result that Christology now describes a spirit or ethos, which was perhaps manifested in and through Jesus, but more perfectly by the liberal churches themselves. Christology has been absorbed into ecclesiology. But that's just one example of a deep line problem. What we find in the liberal churches is a radical erosion of doctrinal seriousness over the last 20 years or so, accompanied by capitulation to our therapeutic culture and various forms of new age spirituality, if not old age gnosis. But it's not much easier to define the word evangelical these days. What's interesting is that the loss of doctrinal seriousness I just described as characteristic of today's liberals, has been documented in the evangelical churches as well in a recent book by David Wells. For Wells, the erosion of doctrinal thinking finds its source in the schismatic tendencies of the more fundamentalist members of the evangelical movement. He's thinking back there to the 30s and 40s. Combined, he says, with the passing of an older generation of theologian pastors, and the coming of organization builders and marketers in the 1960s and 70s. I think there's a lot of truth to what Wells says, though the situation is far more complex than what he describes. What is true is that the core beliefs of traditional Protestantism, doctrines like justification by faith and penal substitution, no longer command the allegiance of all too many evangelicals. There are reasons for this, some conspicuous, some not so obvious. The conspicuous reasons have to do with the impact on forensic theology of the so-called Sanders Revolution, named after E.P. Sanders, in the late 70s. The emergence of a number of so-called new perspectives on Paul in the 1980s. And the joint declaration on the Doctrine of Justification signed by representatives of the Lutheran World Federation and the Pontifical Council for the Promotion of Christian Unity on Reformation Day in 1999. The impact of these and other developments on those Protestant theologians who still care about orthodoxy 
has led to increasing emphasis on those doctrines which historically were shared with Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox, and a decreasing emphasis on those which were distinctive to Protestantism. The not-so-conspicuous factors have to do with the degree to which evangelical theology has been divided internally in recent years over issues long regarded as settled and shared by all Orthodox communions, the doctrine of God, the Trinity, Christology, etc. It has not, in my judgment, been a good sign of the well-being of Protestant theology in this country that at a time when the foundations of core beliefs of core Protestant beliefs were being challenged, evangelical theologians have been engaged in highly polemical infighting over open theism and more recently the so-called subordination debate. You see, the doctrine of God was a matter of peripheral concern in the Reformation era. This was a function in Luther's case of his emphasis on a theology of the cross, his dialectic of divine hiddenness and revealedness and his antipathy towards philosophy. For Calvin, it was the consequence of his commitment to double predestination, a commitment which led him to discourage prying into the eternal counsel of God, largely on pastoral grounds, thus strengthening the anti-speculative tendency which made itself felt throughout his theology, but especially in its lack of a developed doctrine of God's being and attributes. In the definitive 1559 edition of the Institutes, the doctrine of God receives a scant three pages. That this doctrine should now be consuming the energies of a good many evangelical theologians is, I think, a reason for concern. To be sure, issues of doctrinal importance are at stake in these debates. But their importance is surely relative to their place in Protestant theology as a whole, and they need to be considered in a measured way in relation to other doctrines whose content impinges on the decisions made with respect to them. Where theology is carried out in a hothouse atmosphere with emotions running high, where extensive documentation and rigorous argumentation are made casualties by the need to get something into print quickly in response to the last polemical pamphlet, there, theologians have failed to provide the churches with the kind of theological leadership they desperately need. Some years ago, I made a study of open theism in an effort to figure out what all the fuss was about. What I discovered was a very thin theology, a theology driven by a single big idea, namely the rejection of exhaustive divine foreknowledge. All the open theists have at their disposal is a doctrine of God which is itself parasitic on classical theism. Which is to say, open theistic theology draws its life from negating aspects of a classical the theism which it too regards as largely valid and seeks only to modify. What it does not have is a well-developed Christology an understanding of the ontological constitution of the self-revealing God, which might challenge all abstract theisms, including their own. And now, in preparation for these lectures, I have had occasion to read around in the subordination debate involving evangelical advocates of the fun functional subordination of the eternal son, son of God and their critics. Once again, I am greatly disappointed in the quality of these debates, above all by the manifest lack of comprehension on both sides of what the churches teach through their shared commitment to the Nicene-Constantinopolitan creed, in spite of the fact that both sides claim to be defenders of Nicene theology. We find ourselves then in a somewhat odd and quite difficult situation. On the one hand, it is not a good thing that so many evangelical theologians have become single doctrine oriented in their, think, in their theological activity. It's not good that so much energy is devoted to the doctrine of God while core Protestant beliefs beg to be understood well enough so that they might then be cogently explained and defended. <clears throat> 
But given the level of misunderstanding I have just described, perhaps it is also a good thing. If evangelicals actually dig into the history of the formation of the orthodox doctrines of God and Christ, if they learn to understand the issues debated in the 4th and 5th centuries and understand them from the inside, so to speak, as those with a living interest in those in issues, if they should come to a deeper appreciation of the commitments of those who composed the Creed and the Chalcedonian definition, then that would certainly be a very good thing. Whether such an outcome alone could sustain Protestant theology, however, is doubtful. Much more is needed than that. The solution to such shortcomings is comprehensive dogmatic theology, which is done on the basis of extensive knowledge of the history of doctrines in all of their phases, ancient and modern, as well as extensive knowledge of the history of philosophy. Systematic theology consists, for me, in the attempt to think across doctrines. To ask, how is the decision I will have to make in this doctrine affected by decisions I have already made in relation to other doctrines, and vice versa? Where doctrines are treated in an atomistic fashion, there the danger of caprice is high of holding doctrines hostage to other agendas. This is, as Kevin Van Hooser suggested, the third lectureship I will have done in a four-year period. My Torrance lectures in St. Andrews, delivered in December 2007, were devoted to the person of Christ. My Kroll lectures, delivered this year in January, on the theme of the work of Christ. And I now turn to the doctrine of God. The good thing about the kind of pressure I have been under is that I have been forced to think about all of these subjects together, to make decisions in an integrated way, which reduces the temptation to impose agendas quite severely. What I would like to do in the remainder of this particular lecture is to explore the state of evangelical thinking about God through attention to two test cases. First, the subordination debate and then the McCall-Piper debate. I think I can take it for granted that these will be of local interest. <laughs> I will conclude with a brief expl explanation of the methodological, of a methodological commitment which will exercise a considerable influence on the decisions I will be making in the course of these lectures. The commitment in question is the Reformation principle, sola scriptura. More on that later. So we start with the subordination debate. <clears throat> the current debate among evangelical theologians over the relation of the eternal Son to the eternal Father has been labeled the subordination debate by Millard Erickson in the subtitle of a book which he has contributed to this discussion. I think the label to be fair and accurate since the language of eternal subordination was first introduced by Erickson's opponents. In what follows, I'm going to leave to one side the book by Kevin Giles for two reasons. My primary interest here is what this debate tells us about the current state of American evangelicalism. Giles is an Australian who did his doctorate in Tübingen. The second reason is, quite simply, that Giles does not have the shortcomings I am about to discuss here. In fact, I would recommend his book highly to those who would like a much more complete account than I can give in a few pages. The question before the House in this American-inspired debate is this. Is the obedience of the Son to the will of his Father, or we might say subordination, the result of a merely economic arrangement, so that subordination is confined to the period in which the incarnate Lord is carrying out his redemptive work? If so, then subordination has a beginning and an end. It presupposes an equality. That is, because Father and Son share one and the same essence fully and completely, they also share fully and completely in the power and authority that is proper to that essence. <clears throat> 
Or, and here's the alternative, is the obedience of the Son to the Father eternal? Is it somehow intrinsic to the differentiation of the divine persons? Is it, in fact, necessitated by the fact that the Son is eternally generated by the Father? Is it a logically necessary entailment of the biblical use of the names Father and Son? The first position is that of Millard Erickson. The second is that of Bruce Ware and Wayne Grudem. Others are involved, but their work will not be considered here. The heat generated by this controversy has to do with the fact that Ware and Grudem believe that eternal subordination provides the ontological ground in God of that authority submission structure, quote unquote, which in their view ought also to govern human relations. In this way, the complementarianism defended by Ware and Grudem is given a grounding in the eternal relation of father and son. Ware and Grudem are inclined to suspect that their opponents are all egalitarians. Some probably are, but certainly not all. For Erickson in particular, what is at stake is simply biblical teaching and the understanding of the Trinity declared orthodox by the church at Nicaea in 325 AD. But then, Ware and Grudem are just as convinced that, that it is their position which is required by Scripture, and which was in fact taught by the church fathers, which is a second reason for the sometimes ven venomous nature of this controversy, since both sides claim that their opponents have departed from Nicene Christianity which is just a polite way of saying they're heretics. What is most striking about this debate to me is the ignorance on both sides of the most recent and best specialized literature on Nicene Christianity, its development in the fourth century and its aftermath. I am thinking here especially of the much discussed book by Lewis Ayers, but many more could be mentioned. Patristic research has been one of the most significant scholarly ventures in the last century. The literature generated by it is enormous, and there exists a consensus on at least some of the issues basic to the current debate. But there is clear evidence that this consensus is not known by our combatants, not simply because of the absence of references to this literature, but because Ware's position especially presupposes, and I would say indeed requires, a commitment to a particular model of the Trinity, which specialists in patristic research have shown to be utterly without foundation in Nicene Christianity. And if Erickson had been aware of this fact, he would surely have made it basic to his response to where. The fact that Erickson doesn't do this suggests in all likelihood that he either shares the same basic model or he simply fails to see the problems resident in it. The model I'm referring to is that of social Trinitarianism, a view which understands each of the three divine persons to possess his own mind, will, and energy of operation. Three persons means, for social Trinitarians, three individual subjects. That Bruce Ware is a social Trinitarian is made clear when he speaks of the Trinity as a society or a plurality of persons, and then argues that their relationship should serve as a model for human-to-human -human relations. Grudem does not, so far as I've been able to determine, commit himself to this model explicitly, but his desire to pattern human relations on the father-son relation requires something closely akin to it. After all, you cannot have an authority submission structure in the absence of distinct individuals, one of whom quite literally commands, while the other quite literally obeys. If now you were to ask, what is it then that unites these three divine subjects, these three individuals? The answer given by Ware is twofold. First, all three share a numerical numerically identical essence, and second, the three members of the Godhead all will the same thing, 
and work together in harmony to achieve, quote, one undivided purpose, unquote. Whether this is a coherent position or not is a question to which I will return. Talk of a numerical identity of substance is somewhat problematic, but especially so when it is combi combined with social Trinitarianism. The truth is, though, that social Trinitarianism is of relatively recent vintage. It is a view which was, to my knowledge, first proposed by 19th century Roman Catholic theologian Anton Gunther. He spoke of three thinking and willing subjects, all proceeding from one another and forming together a single unified personality. For his efforts, his, he was condemned by Pope Pius IX in 1857. A Protestant version of the same constellation of ideas was advocated by Richard Grutzmacher in 1910. He held to the existence in God of three, what he called, I centers, vertical pronoun, I centers, and understood the unity of the three distinct subjects identified in this way in terms of a collaborative working together towards a shared end, a conception shared as we have already seen by Bruce Ware. A bit closer to our time, and very influential for contemporary forms of social Trinitarianism, are Leonard Hodgson's Kroll Lectures of 1942-1943, published the following year under the title, The Doctrine of the Trinity. Hodgson's book was an important stimulus for the work of Jürgen Moltmann. The latter's, The Trinity and the Kingdom, published in Germany in 1980 and a year later in English translation, gave rise to a veritable flood of monographs celebrating the discovery that the Trinity provides a model for human relations. In this claim, a strong answer was thought to have been found to Kant's critique that the doctrine of the Trinity has no practical relevance whatsoever, and that certainly helps to explain the strength of this movement. Significant later contributions were made by Leonardo Boff, Cornelius Plantinga, and Miroslav Volf. It's important to note, however, that Moltmann and those influenced by him find in the Trinity the model of a perfect democratic society. In other words, social Trinitarianism, social Trinitarianism was created in the 20th century to promote egalitarianism, not functional subordination. More on that in a minute. Now, it is quite true that social Trinitarians would take exception to my characterization of their preferred model as recent. Most would like to believe that it finds a strong root in the so-called social analogy employed by the Cappadocian Fathers, whose pro-Nicene theology won a victory at Constantinople in 381. But, as Lewis Ayers has suggested, the social analogy was probably introduced by unnamed opponents of the Cappadocian Fathers, who wished to make them guilty of worshipping three gods. In any event, Gregory of Nyssa takes up the analogy only to make clear the dissimilarity that the dissimilarity between human persons and divine persons consists in the fact that it is one and the same mind, will, and energy of operation which belongs to each member of the Trinity in an undivided way one and the same mind, will, and energy of operation which belongs to each member of the Trinity in an undivided way. The clue to how to understand this is to be found in Gregory's affirmation of what Ayers calls the principle of inseparable operation. Gregory puts it this way. In the case of men, since we can differentiate the actions of each while they are engaged in the same task, they are rightly referred to in the plural. Each is distinguished from the others by his special environment and his particular way of handling the task. With regard to the divine nature, on the other hand, it is otherwise." Unquote. There is, he continues, one operation which, quote, is not divided among the persons involved. For the action of each in any matter is not separate and individualized, unquote. And if we were to ask Gregory then, what is the reason? His answer is clear. Quote, there is but one motion and disposition of the good will which proceeds from the Father through the Son to the Spirit. Unquote. 
one will and one operation shared by all, not three wills and three operations. Ayers is surely right to object to the attribution to divine persons of, quote, a psychological density parallel to that found in human persons, unquote. Such a claim rests in the main, he says, on 20th century personalist philosophies. Ayers is also right to insist that the alternative to three acting agents for Gregory is not one acting agent. The one will and energy of operation are possessed fully and completely by each of the three. Still, allowing for the important differences that exist between 4th century theology and 20th century theology, differences which will emerge clearly in the course of these lectures, Gregory of Nyssa stands much closer to Karl Barth than he does to Jürgen Moltmann. My point, though, is this. All of the participants in the current subordination debate which is taking place in American evangelicalism claim to be representing the officially recognized teaching of the ancient church. In truth, none of them are. The basic model with which Ware works is that of three individual subjects whose unity consists in cooperative labor. The ancient church would have regarded this model as tritheistic. There can be little question of that in the light of Ayer's magisterial work. Ware makes other fairly egregious mistakes which, while not, not touching directly on the issues at the heart of the debate, give further evidence of his lack of acquaintance with the fourth century and the literature on it. Consider, for example, the following passage taken from his book, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Quote, the Arian view, he says, gained a large following, and to address it, a church council was called at Nicaea in AD 325. At the council of Nicaea, a number of Arians were present, arguing the position of their leader. But the hero of the Council of Nicaea was a bishop by the name of Athanasius. Athanasius was a very gifted, godly theologian who defended the deity of Christ against Arius' view that Christ was merely a highly exalted created being. No, argued Athanasius, the New Testament record is so clear and strong for Christ's deity that we must affirm that Christ is of the very same nature as the Father. The Greek word that Athanasius used here is homoousios, indicating that Christ possessed the identically same nature as the Father." Unquote. In this brief passage, which I have just read to you, there are three errors of fact. First, Athanasius did not become Bishop of Alexandria until three years after Nicaea had completed its work. Second, there is no solid evidence that Athanasius was even present at the council. And third, Athanasius did not become a defender of the word homoousios until the early 350s. More could be said, but I think I've made my point. The bottom line is that where a spouse is a model of the Trinity which finds historical precedent really only in 20th century social Trinitarianism, a model that was created to promote egalitarianism. That Ware now wishes to use it to produce the very opposite is something he achieves solely by means of an overly literal employment of father-son language. As Augustine rightly pointed out, the use of these words, common enough on the plane of human-to-human -human relations, is analogical in nature and shouldn't be pressed. What then of the contended issues? I have spoken at some length of the inadequacy of the basic model presupposed by Ware and Grudem, and even now the full consequences of that fateful choice have yet to be identified. But what of the contended issue of subordination? Erickson clearly has the Christian tradition on his side, but only up to a point. He is right in insisting that the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity maintains an equality of power and authority amongst the members of the Godhead. On that question, there really should be no debate. That also means that he is correct to say that such evidence of subordination as can be found in the New Testament was consistently referred by the orthodox after Constantinople to what today is typically called the economy. Subordination belongs to the economy to it alone. 
The problem for Erickson, however, is that he has to concede that some, at least, of the New Testament passages adduced by his opponents do indeed seem to call into question not only his position, but with that, the Orthodox tradition itself. Most important of all in this respect is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 to 28. I'm going to have more to say about this passage in my lecture on the New Testament, which comes on Thursday. Suffice it here to say that Erickson readily concedes that this passage certainly seems to teach what Ware says it does, namely an eternal subordination of the Son to the Father. After all, the final act in the transition from the economy back to the imminent relations proper to Father and Son is the subjection of the Son to the Father who has subjected all things to him, according to verse 28. Erickson actually goes so far as to say, quote, the plainest and most obvious interpretation of this text is that which Grudem states. Unless there is strong evidence in Scripture, he's here quoting Grudem, showing a later change in that situation, the subjection of the Son to the one who subjected all things to him, unless there is strong evidence in Scripture showing a later change in that situation, the, which there is not, the passage leads us to think that the situation will continue for eternity. Unquote. Faced with the difficulties posed by this passage in particular and Grudem's use of it, Erickson's strategy is twofold. First, he seeks to qualify its significance by surrounding it with an impressive number of passages which seem to point in a different direction. Chief among them are passages which ascribe the same activities or functions to both father and son, for example, choosing or predestinating judging the world, sending the Holy Spirit, etc., and passages which testify to the unity or oneness of Father and Son. But second, and more importantly, he suggests that we should choose that understanding of the relative authority of Father and Son, which, quote, fits the largest number of biblical passage, passages with the least distortion, unquote. Erickson believes that when this is done, it will be understood with Charles Hodge that the one who is said in 1 Corinthians 15, 28 to be subjected to the Father is not the second person of the Trinity as such, but that person as clothed in our human nature. And the subjection spoken of is not of the former, but of the latter, not of the Son as Son, but of the Son as incarnate, unquote. I have to say, this is a neat and tidy solution, but probably much too neat and tidy. Certainly, it's a solution which could only have been conceived of after the Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity had been put in place at Constantinople in 381. Paul makes no mention in his writings of a son as son. The pre-existent son is for him, as I will show later in these lectures, the son who is already determined for incarnation. A son whose identity already includes the humanity he will assume in time. Paul knows of no other son. All of this is to say, I think myself that Ware and Grudem are better exegetes of 1 Corinthians 15.28 than was my justly revered predecessor at Princeton, Charles Hodge. Does this make them right in their controversy with Erickson and their other critics? No, it does not. Not even close. The problem with Ware and Grudem is that while they are right in believing that it is not possible to eliminate every last vestige of an eternal subordination from the New Testament, they join this element with an understanding of differentiation in God along the lines of three distinct individuals. Let me put this as plainly as I can. The subordination of one subject to another results necessarily in a hierarchy of beings, and that is precisely what the early church was concerned to oppose under the heading of subordinationism. Ware and Grudem would like to resist this conclusion by their insistence that the three equally possess one numerically identical substance, thus reducing subordination to the merely functional. The problem is that such a position is fundamentally incoherent. 
If what we have before us are three distinct subjects, then unity and differentiation can no longer be explained in terms of a single substance. Aristotle's distinction between primary and secondary substance comes immediately into play. For Aristotle, a primary substance is the being of an individual thing or person. Secondary substance is what we might think of as a class term, an abstract noun by means of which we name the attributes proper to all members of a class. Okay, so a horse, and every horse belongs to that class. Every individual horse belongs to that class. So the concrete uh, primary substance is Dobbin standing over there in a the field, and the secondary substance is the abstract collective noun by which we name all horses. Okay? Notice that secondary substance is nowhere instantiated in reality. It's just a general concept which has been devised by human knowers in their efforts to exhaustively define what a thing is. And so to speak of the persons of the Trinity as individuals is to make them members of a class, which also means that each member has to have its own substance, and that the list of properties thought to be common to them is the result of abstractive human reasoning, which is not instantiated in reality. Now, Gregory of Nyssa really understood this. He uses this distinction, Aristotle's distinction between primary and secondary substance, in his famous letter 38 to explain that the divine substance is not a secondary substance in Aristotle's sense. It's real, which cannot be the case if we're thinking of three distinct individuals. It's real, which is why the Cappadocians are able to believe that there is one and the same will and energy of operation at work in the triune God which passes from the Father through the Son and to the Holy Spirit being present in each individual uh, in an undivided way in each individual, in each person. Admittedly, talk of a numerical identity of substance is not finally, fully adequate to this state of affairs either, but it's much closer to the truth than talk of three substantially distinct individuals. In any event, Ware and Grudem must finally make a choice. Either affirm a substantial unity or affirm three individuals. You can't have it both ways. In short, Erickson is right to say that a functional subordination that's truly, truly eternal has to mean an essential difference between father and son. But Erickson is right without really understanding or knowing why he is right. In truth, his statement is correct only because Ware and Grudem treat father and son as distinct individuals. If that were the case, then a functional differentiation would necessitate a gradation not just in authority, but in power, and therefore in being or essence. But it is not correct as a generalized statement. If, for example, one were operating with the, within the framework of Karl Barth's model of a single divine subject in three modes of being, which I do, then the subordination of the Son to the Father would be an act of self-subordination, or better, self-humiliation, on the part of a single divine subject, and it would not result in the subordinationism rightly condemned by the church at all. I should probably say that again. Though it be, would be wrong to seek to stamp out every last vestige of eternal subordination found in the New Testament in our efforts to construct a doctrine of the Trinity, subordinationism is always wrong because it requires three distinct individual minds and wills to get off the ground in the first place. And that, as I've shown, is something the ancient church rejected out of hand. Why do I emphasize this point? You're going to hear me exegete 1 Corinthians 15, 28 in precisely the same way Ware does later in these lectures. But the model of the Trinity, which I will elaborate on the basis of this exegesis, will be worlds removed from his. He is a subordinationist. I am not. So please, do not, any of you, let me hear or read that I argued in these lectures for a form of subordinationism <laughs> without mentioning the fact that I gave that term a clear and distinct definition, the one also given to it by the early church, mind you, and rejected it. <laughs>
do not make the mistake of confusing my position with Bruce Ware's. If you do, it's going to be like J.T. Hodges says in his hit song, I'm going to hunt you down. <laughs> the decisive point is this. When in the later volumes of the Church Dogmatics, Bart posits an eternal humility and obedience, which he says is constitutive of the being of the Son, we must bear in mind that what is really, he is really talking about here is the act of a single subject in his second mode of being. The command and obedience structure which is employed by Bart in this context to describe the act of self-subordination is metaphorically intended. It can only be that because the names Father and Son are themselves employed analogically, a point already made by Bart in Church Dogmatics 1.1. What we have before us in Bart's case is an eternal act of self-repetition in the being of one divine subject. Without ceasing to be what he is as God in his first mode of being, God is also a second and a third mode of being, the triune God. That there is an eternal subordination in Bart's thinking is quite true. But it is not the subordination of one divine subject to another and it in no way grounds or justifies hierarchical relations on the plane of human-to-human -human relations. I might say, before leaving this subject, that complementarianism is, for me personally, distasteful, even odious, as an ethical model. But that doesn't make me an egalitarian exactly, though that might be a little closer to my view. But both of these complexes of ideas draw their life from metaphysical and indeed essentialistic thinking about something called manhood and womanhood, which in my view have no reality whatsoever. One last comment, and I'm done with this controversy, for good I hope. I was very surprised to find both sides to this debate quite willing, readily willing, in a hurry to, dispense with the doctrine of the Son's eternal generation. And I would take it with the Spirit's procession from Father and Son. I am surprised, to be honest, because the eternal processions of the, Spirit, of the Son and the Spirit belong to the elements in Orthodox Trinitarianism with the clearest biblical grounding in John 118 and 1526, respectively. That where and Grudem could think they could do without it is at least understandable given the fact that they have another way to differentiate between the persons of the Trinity, namely through their assertion of differing degrees of authority. That Erickson thought he could do without it is a bit shocking. After all, modes of origination was the only device by means of which the Cappadocians and Augustine were finally able to differentiate divine persons from one another. Does Erickson have anything to replace it with? How does he distinguish the persons from one another, finally? As far as I can tell, the answer is nothing. He can't. Erickson has no basis on which he can intelligibly distinguish the persons. The contenders in this debate are undoubtedly well-intentioned, but watching them at work is at times rather like watching a person in his late 50s, I'm talking about myself, <coughs> trying to make use of a sophisticated piece of new technology, let's say the most recent version of an Android phone, without benefit of an instruction manual. We all know that only kids can do that. Adults need a manual. I found out when I bought this thing, they don't provide them anymore. You just have to ask your kid. Adults need a manual. And that is what the history of the doctrine of the Trinity in its ancient and modern phases provides us with. If we do not study this material carefully on its own terms, rather than seeking to find in it an answer to a question of our own devising, we are bound to make a lot of mistakes, which already, after painstaking investigation and a great deal of sweat, blood, and tears, have been identified as such and set aside. I move then to a very different debate, different both in subject matter and in quality of argumentation. The McCall-Piper debate. A few years ago, there was a committee on confessions in the Presbyterian Church USA, and somebody mentioned at the outset that the Eastern Orthodox are offended by our affirmation of the filioque. 
And somebody else said, oh, there's a problem with the Nicene Creed? <clears throat> Let's fix it. Why not? Okay. The McCall-Piper debate. The primary subject of this debate, at least the part that is most interesting to me, has to do with the problem of the relation of necessity and freedom in God. The debate is also concerned with the classical doctrine of double predestination. What is said on this topic is not new and rests on a caricature of the classical reform view, though the caricature may well be shared by both parties to the debate. I don't doubt for a minute that Dr. McCall understands his opponent. But the cent central issue is this. Does the justification given by Piper of God's all-determining sovereignty not have, as its unintended consequence, an undermining of the divine aseity, or self-sufficiency? That is the question, and its meaning will become clear as I proceed. The debate unfolds in three installments, first a critique by McCall of a series of assertions found in Piper's writings. This is followed by a response from Piper. McCall then has another go at trying to make his critique stick. Piper did not choose to take the debate any further. Now, I should say, full disclosure now, before entering into this material, that I was a member of the Church of the Nazarene for the first 16 years of my Christian life and a convinced Arminian for the first seven of those. All of that changed when I took a course on Wesley's theology at Nazarene Theological Seminary. Wesley's arguments against predestination left me convinced that the Calvinists had to be right after all, only with much swearing under my breath. I was a Calvinist for the next four to five years until I found a very different account of double predestination in Bart, which pointed me in a rather different direction. But I continued, and I do continue to this day, to love and admire Calvin himself. And Calvinism remains the neighborhood in which I live. Schleiermacher and Bart also have houses there. It's a nice neighborhood. All of this is to say, to my friend, new friend Tom, while I don't embrace Piper's position, I am rather more sympathetic to his views than to McCall's. I respect the Calvinist understanding of predestination because I recognize that Bart might be wrong. And if he is, then the Calvinists are surely right. So now you know where I'm coming from. Okay. McCall's critique begins with a stipulation. Divine sovereignty, as it is employed in the Reformed tradition, entails the following commitments. First, God is sovereign over any event E, if and only if God determines that E occurs, Unquote. And second, quote, God is sovereign over any agent, A, if and only if God determines all of A's actions, unquote. McCall never defines the crucial word determines in his two propositions in this first essay, and that may help to explain why Piper did not challenge his propositions as they stand. Of course, another explanation would be that he just agrees, in which case he has a problem too. We gain clearer insight into what McCall has in mind, however, in his second essay. There he employs an analogy, and I quote, Imagine a parent who is able to control each and every action of his children, and furthermore is able to do so by controlling their thoughts and inclinations. He is thus able to guarantee that they desire to do everything they do, and this is exactly what he does, unquote. What follows from this starting point is rather easy to predict. The father puts them in a room that contains toys, but also gasoline and matches, instructs him, them not to touch the latter, and leaves. But of course, he has pre-programmed them to disobey, and when they do, he breaks into the room and saves three of his children from burning to death, but quite deliberately leaves four others to their fate, even though it was within his power to save them as well. This is the caricature I mentioned earlier. 
The problem is that determinism is defined by McCall in terms of causal necessity. When he says that the parent controls thoughts and inclinations, what he's basically saying is that the parent programs his children to behave as they do, that he is the cause of their behavior. This, I think it is fair to conclude, is the meaning he attaches to the word determinism in the two propositions with which he opens the first essay. What such a definition implies is that God is omnicausal, that he is, on the Calvinist view, the cause of all events. And notice, all events, including the fall. In truth, however, the Reformed tradition always backed away from such a conclusion. Calvin himself had little or no interest in metaphysics. The concept of divine causality did not play much of a role in his, thir- in his thinking, certainly not with respect to God. And even though it is true that causality does play a larger role in later Reformed theology, the thought that God makes a causal contribution to every single event in order to ensure that those events happen as he has willed them to happen eternally and in the exact sequence in which he has willed them. This view admitted, even then, even in the 17th century, of a grand exception. A line was always drawn at the fall itself. Now, why is that important? Because according to classical Reformed theology, God does not need to do anything in order to ensure that the reprobate do not come to faith. He simply passes over them. He lets them be who and what they are and what they want to be in their sinfulness. And if they are then condemned, they have nothing about which to complain since the condition which prevents them from coming to faith is a condition for which they bear responsibility. God did not cause this condition. Adam caused it. And all humans share in the guilt which accrues to Adam's first sin. So in classical Reformed theology, there's a fundamental asymmetry between election and reprobation. Effectual calling does require a causal contribution by God, and even there its nature would still have to be defined carefully. Preterition clearly does not. But then, does the fact that God does not cause the fall get him off the hook where responsibility for the existence of sin and evil is concerned? Not entirely, no. For if God possesses exhaustive divine foreknowledge, then he knows what is going to happen before he creates. If then he goes ahead and creates, then he bears responsibility for what happens. But then that is just as much a problem for McCall as it is for Piper. And in fact, I think that exhaustive divine foreknowledge has many more implications, of which neither McCall nor Piper seem to be aware. I'm going to explain that in just a moment. Suffice it here to say that the claim that God bears responsibility for sin and evil does not require that we make God the cause of either one. So McCall is not at his best in critiquing double predestination, not at least if his critique is meant to have wider applicability than just to Piper and his followers. What is interesting, however, is McCall's thesis on divine aseity, To understand the thesis, we must begin with the Reformed belief that God wills all things. That is, whatever happens in the created universe has been eternally willed by God. McCall's concern, quite understandably, is that such a view would make God the author of sin and evil, and indeed bring him into contradiction with himself, since he commands that we not sin, but has eternally willed that our acts of sin should take place. Now, I have deliberately changed the language here just a bit and spoken of God willing sin and evil rather than determining in a causal sense that they exist in order to be more fair to the Reformed. But even with this change of terminology, the problem to which McCall points is real enough. The question which cries for an answer is, why would God do that? Why would God ordain that sin should exist and that horrendous evil should occur? It is Piper's answer to this question which stands at the center of McCall's critique. Piper's initial answer to this most existential of questions is that God ordained that sin and evil should exist in order that he might exercise the full range of his attributes, 
not only his love and mercy, but also his justice and righteousness. If God is to be known by rational creatures and glorified for who and what he truly is, then all of his attributes will have to be on display. And so the world as we know it in its fallen state is actually, according to Piper, the best of all possible worlds, because it is the one world in which God can be maximally glorified. And it follows that such a world is needed if God is to reveal himself fully. A certain ambiguity enters into the picture at this point, however. Is the need in question merely subjective, or is it also objective? That is to say, is it merely the case that the elect need themselves to be confronted with God's just judgment upon the reprobate in order to fully appreciate the utter gratuity of the mercy shown to them? Or does God somehow need to reveal himself fully in order to be who and what he is? What kind of necessity are we dealing with here? Piper seems to push the answer in the direction of the objective when he says that it is God's essential nature, and here I'm quoting, God's essential nature mainly to dispense mercy, which would seem to imply that it is also essential to God to reveal his justice in the condemnation of the reprobate. And he cites with approval the following statement from Jonathan Edwards, quote, It is proper that the shining forth of God's glory be complete, that is, that all parts of his glory should shine forth. Thus, it is necessary that God's awful majesty, his authority and dreadful greatness, justice and holiness, should be manifested. But this could not be unless sin and punishment had been decreed, so that the shining forth of God's glory would be very imperfect, both because those parts of divine glory would not shine forth as others do, and also, the glory of his goodness, love, and holiness would be faint without them. Nay, they would scarcely shine forth at all, unquote. Now, I think it's understandable when these two assertions are seen together, Piper's and Edward's, that McCall would conclude that, quote, God would be imperfect were it not for the exercise and display of these attributes, unquote. And he draws the inevitable conclusion. Piper seems to make creation to be necessary to God. God can only be fully God if the full range of his attributes are, in fact, exercised, and exercised in full display and full view of human beings. But this, McCall says, calls into question God's aseity, the fact that God is fully himself with or without a world. McCall insists that the love that God's being that the love that God's being is, is fully expressed and realized in the eternal communion of the Trinitarian persons. That God should choose to create is, in fact, an act of freedom. And McCall explicitly says that he understands divine freedom in a sense closely akin to libertarian freedom, voluntaristic freedom. On this showing, God could just as well have created other worlds or no world at all. God had options, and it is in the having of options that his freedom consists. Deny this, and you make God dependent upon the world in order to be fully God. McCall understands Piper to be veering quite close to a, quote, panentheism that borders on Spinozan pantheism, unquote. Them's fighting words. In his response, Piper acknowledges that he spoke injudiciously. And although he claims that his position has not been rightly interpreted by McCall, he accepts responsibility for the misunderstanding that has arisen. He, too, is fully committed to divine aseity. And the necessity of which he speaks is what the old reform would have called hypothetical rather than absolute. That is to say, if God freely decided to reveal himself as he truly is, then the full exercise of his attributes in election and reprobation is how he would have had to have done it. Piper thus still thinks that this is the best of all possible worlds, that having decided to create, this world is made by that decision to be necessary since God can be maximally glorified only in a world like ours. It is necessary that revelation take place in this way if it is to take place at all, but God could have chosen not to create and would have been fully himself without a world. The decision to create is itself a contingent decision. <clears throat> 
So Piper too thinks God had options. He just thinks the options were considerably more limited than does McCall. Now one might have thought that the debate would end there. Piper has not modified his position, but he has explained it more carefully so that McCall's worries about divine aseity have been assuaged. But I suspect McCall wasn't just interested in aseity. He was deeply unhappy with Piper's ongoing commitment to double predestination and determinism. And so he comes back a second time in an effort to demonstrate that Piper's commitment to double predestination makes God a monster. Thus far the debate. Those committed to something akin to an Arminian perspective will no doubt come away from reading this debate believing that McCall has won a resounding victory. Supporters of Piper will feel that their hero has been very gracious in explaining his true position and accepting responsibility for the misunderstanding. And they will consider the criticisms directed against double predestination to be rather pointless, since they are firmly convinced that their depiction of God and of God's ways with the world is correct and that criticisms of it are a futile exercise in beating one's head against the walls of the universe. You had any headaches lately? So who's right? <laughs> who's right? My answer is neither of them. This is a scholastic debate carried out on the soil of a metaphysical conception of divine being. I have treated this debate here because it nicely illustrates another point I wish to make about the state of American evangelicalism today. If the participants in the first debate I considered showed themselves to be ill-informed about the history of the formation of the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity, McCall and Piper have too little understanding of modern treatments of the being and attributes of God. In Piper's case, of course, that's not accidental. He has no interest in things modern because he's convinced that the old reform pretty much got things right. McCall is far more interested, but he tends to favor those contemporary writers who share with him the belief that the old metaphysics are still the best on offer. Above all, David Bentley Hart. Let me get at the shortcomings of both positions just considered in the following way. Both McCall and Piper are committed to exhaustive divine foreknowledge. And it is well that they should be. It is, in my judgment, the biblical view. But consider what we have committed ourselves to when we have said that God knows all things eternally in an immediate act of intuition and not by searching things out discursively, building knowledge upon knowledge. God knows all things perfectly, Thomas says, in knowing himself perfectly. But that then means that God knows from eternity precisely what he will do. He knows what he will do before he does it. But not only that, if the basis of God's knowledge of all things is his perfect knowledge of himself, then he knows what he is going to will to do before he actually wills it. Now that's actually a nonsensical idea. If God knows with complete certainty what he's going to will before he actually wills it, then the supposedly subsequent act of willing would have been evacuated of all significance. It would have been absorbed into the knowing itself. And so, if God knows what he is going to will before he wills it, then his knowing of it simply is his willing. He knows he is not going to will anything other than this world in knowing himself. His eternal will, then, is to do that which he in fact does. Therefore, knowing and willing are equally original in God. But if that is the case, and if knowing is immediate, then willing is immediate as well. There is no delay for deliberation or reflection, no options to be considered. There is only one option, and that is what God actually does and knows eternally that he will do. And that then means that the only possible world is the one God in fact wills. Talk of the best of all possible worlds, plural, is nonsense. Talk of counterfactuals is not only speculative, it completely lacks reality, as do all idols of the human imagination. That alone is real, which God knows in knowing himself perfectly. Seen in this light, McCall's preference for something akin to a libertarian conception of divine freedom can only be seen, in my judgment, as a rather crude anthropomorphizing of the divine. <clears throat> 
The fact that he is able to press Piper to acknowledge something rather close to it, in spite of Piper's natural inclination to push in the direction of compatibilism, shows that Piper too doesn't quite get it. Piper is actually right to say, I think, that what happens in God's act of creating has a certain necessity about it. But the act itself is also, again in a certain sense, necessary for God. I say in a certain sense because God is not conditioned by anything that is not himself in creating. He's not in the least dependent upon the creation. Nor does he act in order to give himself to something he would otherwise lack, in order to make up for some kind of deficiency in his being. God has his being in the eternal act in which, among other things, he turns towards creation. And so he acts out of the fullness of his being, not out of want. An event in which willing is immediate is obviously a unique event. There is no pre-existing subject here who engages in a process of deliberation. No three subjects to hold a council meeting and make arrangements. There is instead a subject who has his being in an eternal act. More can be said about this event on the basis of what is disclosed in Revelation about its content, but this is about as far as we can go, I think, on the basis of a single biblical root, namely that of exhaustive divine foreknowledge. The point I wish to make here, though, is that you cannot define words like necessity and freedom as they apply to an utterly unique event on any other basis than the event itself. If you try to do this, if you try to define them on the basis of something other than the event itself, you will be allowing created situations or events to control their meaning. The attempt to then apply them to a unique event will either cause the element of uniqueness to be identified by the external conditions which give rise to the definitions you're employing, if you're trying to think analogically, or to be destroyed altogether, if you're applying those definitions univocally. Either way, there's no way to be sure that the unique event you wind up describing, excuse me, <laughs> there's no way to be sure that the event you wind up describing is truly the unique event that God is. Both look very much like an exercise in what Feuerbach identified as projection, which is one of the reasons why the God of classical metaphysics came to be discredited in the modern world. If, in spite of the dubious nature of the enterprise, you opt for the first possibility, analogical thinking, and most do, you will likely try to reassure yourself that this is no mere projection on the grounds that what is found in the created order, that is, your starting point in constructing the analogy, expresses or manifests the unique event that God is. Not exhaustively, but truly, as the saying goes. But, of course, that outcome, the tight correlation between the two, was guaranteed in advance by the construction itself, by the tight correlation of an arbitrarily chosen starting point with the analogue gate which has been constructed on the basis of that starting point. The charge of projection will therefore not go away with all due respect to David Bentley Hart. The arguments advanced in the McCall-Piper debate are for the most part centuries old. So is the metaphysically based theological ontology which makes it possible and necessary. But much has happened in the last three centuries to call that ontology into question. McCall and Piper either do not fully understand the significance of modernity, or, I suspect in the case of Piper, do not much care. Were we to operate on the basis of the theological ontology I have gestured towards here, that God's being is a being in an act, which includes movement towards creation rather than an enclosed and isolated being, then we would have to judge that of the two, Piper stood closer to the truth. At least he did until he started backpedaling from it. <coughs> I would not myself back away from my ontology just because someone accused me of making creation necessary to God. I would simply insist that words like necessity and freedom, and in fact all the attributes we ascribe to God, including eternity and its relation to time, can only rightly be defined by the event itself and not in abstraction from it. It is certainly possible on this basis to establish a robust creator-creature distinction, as these lectures will demonstrate. How, then, would I handle the challenge posed by the existence of horrendous evils, since I pushed myself in Piper's direction? 
Well, the first thing I'd do is get rid of the concept of omnicausality. God is omnipotent. God is not omnicausal. No causal contribution on God's part is needed to explain, for example, why a tsunami occurs. Scientists are able to provide a fully adequate explanation of its causes without appealing to God. Second, I would insist that although God wills all things, how could he not if he knows they will take place in the world he will create before he creates it? He does not will sinful actions or natural evils as such. What he does is to will the kind of world in which such things can contingently happen. He does not will an earthquake here and a genocide over there. But he does will to bring events that he does not will as such under his control so that they are made to serve in the long run his redemptive purposes. Bringing good out of evil, by the way, does not change the character of evil. It is never a good thing that horrendous evils happen. And the help that God brings in their wake does not make them so. God can intervene to prevent evils from occurring, yes. But more often than not, he seems not to choose to do so. That I, as a theologian, am unable to explain why he does not intervene more often does not make me unique. No Christian theologian can answer the why question as it applies to particular events. And third and finally, I don't think that the challenge that the existence of horrendous evils poses to Christian faith is adequately addressed by simply saying that the good God will bring about in the end far exceeds the oceans of misery through which human beings pass in the meantime. That is part of the answer I would give, but as it stands, it's wholly inadequate. For that answer only makes sense if God is the kind of God who does not stand off at a distance, shaking his head sympathetically over our plight, but actually enters into it, taking it into his own life and being so that it might truly be made otherwise. To put it bluntly, no Christian theodicy can be effective which does not have a place for the suffering of God in Jesus Christ. Conclusion. So, is the Reformation over? I sincerely hope not, but the signs aren't good. I have offered you two test cases in this lecture which demonstrate a resurgence of interest in the doctrine of God amongst evangelicals. The fact that the treatments studied here have significant shortcomings is not the primary point of the exercise, however. The purpose of the exercise has been to suggest that a tremendous amount of energy is being devoted to the doctrine of God by conservative evangelicals at a time when so-called evangelical Catholics, whose concentration on a particular understanding of the Trinity provides the grounds for a soteriology which is quite alien to Protestant soteriology, are seeking to refashion the evangelical movement in their own image. Mind you, I am good friends with many evangelical Catholics and have learned a great deal from them. I just happen to think that evangelical Catholicism should be a side dish, so to speak, and not the main course within American evangelicalism. My hope is that the evangelical movement can still regain its Protestant sensibilities and commitments. Now, you might well be thinking, well, if all this is true, why has McCormick chosen to treat the doctrine of God in these lectures? Why not justification? The short answer is that I do, do not believe that a forensic account of justification can be adequately defended any longer in the absence of a theological ontology that is fully and completely commensurate with it. The greatest shortcoming of the Reformers lay in their failure to develop a theological ontology which was designed from start to finish to nourish a forensic conception of the death of Christ and of justification. It is my hope in these lectures to supply what is missing. One last point and I'm done. My procedure in the coming lectures will be to begin with the development of the doctrine of God in lectures two and three, turning next to the New Testament material in lecture four, and then finally to the task of doctrinal construction in lectures five through seven. To proceed in this way honors the legitimate role played by the Christian tradition in any genuinely Protestant theology. The goal here will be to critically scrutinize the historical development in the light of Holy Scripture. But to do that, we must first have that history before us. I'll turn to that task 
tomorrow. Thank you very much. Well, I've been looking forward to this personally for months, uh, knowing it would be an extremely interesting um, time of theological reflection and conversation. I didn't know quite how interesting it would be, um, but it's, um, it's even more interesting than I thought. So I'm sure many of you are interested in things. Of course, um, I'm certainly hoping we'll have plenty of time to chat because I think we have plenty to chat about. If you'll, I know I went over, yeah. but um, if you'll let us go for 20 minutes, I think it would be great. Is that good? Okay, sure. Uh, we'll, if you, we have microphones on either side, um, and we'll take questions. I'm, I'm guessing we'll get a chance to chat yeah. about these matters later. We have plenty yeah, to chat about. You can ask a question if you want. Sure. <laughs> uh, we have microphones on both sides, and, and um, if you could make your way to those um, microphones in the aisles, um, that would be a great way to begin. Oh, um, yeah. I'm. Um, I've read read several of your books, and I'm, I'm pretty convinced of your actualistic approach. Uh, I have a question. I read Biroslav Wolf's uh, Exclusion and Embrace, and in this book, uh, he criticized uh, the Bart's approach to the uh, the Trinity's um, interaction, and uh, his point is, uh, the Father and Son becomes uh, one substance uh, where. The son has no unique character. And so he used Joseph Rossinger's point to say um, that's a better alternative. And he used, he used Moltmann's as well. And, and then how do you respond to uh, his point, especially in light of the, uh, in the Revelation, the book of Revelation, where the son and the father are de depicted as distinctive persons and they have distinctive actions even in eschatological terms? <coughs> um. Wolf's a student of Moltmann's, and his understanding of the Trinity and his critique of Bart really don't differ from that found in Moltmann's book, The Trinity and the Kingdom. So responding to one is, is to respond to one is to respond to both. Uh, Moltmann basically thinks that Bart is a modalist. Um, what Bart says is modalism historically means uh, understanding the three modes of being, not as modes of being, but as modes of appearance behind which stands a hidden fourth something. That's what the church condemned under that label, he says, under the label of Sabellianism. Uh, Moltmann, on the other hand, when he is trying to deliver himself from the charge of Tritheism, uh, says that, tr that there never has been a Tritheist in the history of Christian theology. Um, and he can say that because he thinks that um, the three in cooperating cooperate eternally. They don't come together after a period of time where they were isolated individuals and then suddenly begin cooperating. They always cooperated. But the problem with that is Moltmann has to invent a new definition of the word tritheism in order to get himself off the hook, whereas Bart does not have to invent a new definition of the word modalism to get himself off the hook. In other words, I think it's only fair to say that when we use heretical labels, we need to be very conscious of the issues that were under consideration when those labels were created and what precisely the church was condemning when it condemned uh, views under those labels. If we, if we engage in a kind of expansive reasoning that turns what was historically condemned into a kind of type, as in a typology, we're actually engaging in unecclesial thinking because this is not what the church historically condemned. You follow my point? What Bart says modalism is, is what the church, early church says it is. And he has a clear explanation for why he's not that. So, it's not a problem. Kevin, you just step right up. Yeah, just, I'll give you this one here. Thanks. Um, the, <clears throat> at a key moment in your argument with Professor McCall, you talked about knowing and willing, and the argument moved quickly for me. Um, and what wasn't clear to me was, 
why there couldn't be at least a logical, if not an actual, distinction between knowing and willing sufficient to do what Professor McCall needs, right? I know you're willing in other cases to grant such logical, if not actual, distinction. So I wasn't clear how the, 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 the movement process, of the argument went. The process of the argument unfolded this way. Um, Thomas says God knows all things in knowing himself. He knows himself perfectly, therefore he knows all things perfectly, right? So in knowing himself perfectly, he knows exactly what he will do before he does it. That much is non-negotiable. He does say that. And the point I added to that was, if that were true, if in knowing perfectly what he will do before he, he does it, he also would know perfectly what he will will to do before he wills it. Now, if he knows what he will do before he wills it, then the act of willing is evacuated of significance. Knowing what he will will is already willing. Yeah, you can have you can have a go. Yeah, well, um, we on here. Yeah, I appreciate that. I uh, appreciate that, Kevin. The distinction between knowing and willing here. Um, one thing, it's just not clear to me why it's evacuated of significance. But all I need here is um, some some version of a doctrine of divine simplicity, which is what Aquinas has as well when he says knowing is the same thing as God's willing. But I don't know, it's unclear to me why I say a scotistic doctrine of simplicity wouldn't give me what I need to make the, the case I need. Define for me, as well as others, the difference between a Thomistic and a scotist understanding of simplicity. Well, on my understanding, uh, Aquinas says there are no real distinctions in God. It doesn't mean there are no genuine distinctions. It means there's no distinction between a thing and a thing. My understanding of the Scotist account is he's willing to um, deny that there are real distinctions within God, but grant that there's more than a merely conceptual distinction, thus the formal distinction. And um, if there's at least, it, it, even a formal distinction between willing and knowing, then the, I don't see how it's evacuated of significance. I'll say this as well. The argument moved quickly for me yeah. as well. Usually when we speak of divine attributes, we're not talking about knowing and willing. We're talking more generally about omnipotence and omniscience. Okay, that mean those are the terms we use to describe. I don't think that the distinction you just developed is relevant to the question that I'm raising. And the reason has to do in part with how I understand Thomas himself. Um, I understand Thomas to be saying that the divine goodness is by nature self-diffusive. And in fact, the knowledge of God is causative. So in knowing himself, he is already establishing a relation with the world. Uh, Matthew Levering, in a very recent article in response to me, makes the suggestion that the eternal processions contain the missions. God is never without a relation to the creation. That's, that's what I'm pressing towards but I'm going to do it without any conception of simplicity, which only confuses the issue. Well, um, with respect to confusing the issue on simplicity doctrine, um, you're going to love tomorrow. <laughs> I'm sure we all will. I'm already looking forward to it. Um, I'm not sure that the distinction, though, it's still unclear to me why that, the distinction between knowing and willing. Um, I know that there are readings of Aquinas which tend toward um, frankly some re people read him as determinist, I certainly don't the, there is though with respect to this a clear distinction in Aquinas, is there not, between the missions which he says are not eternal and the yeah. processions which are both yeah. eternal and necessary? Yeah, he says that the processions have an eternal term, namely the three persons of the Godhead and that the missions have a temporal term, but the temporal term is, is contained in the eternal term and that's, that's a function of the self-diffusive nature of the divine goodness in question four. And it's a, sub, it's a function of the causative nature of divine knowledge And I think question five. And yet, on, okay. and yet um, there is a distinction, though, for him. Right? Between the, the Between professions, the processions and, the and the missions. Yeah, and there one is for me, too. One of which is both necessary. There is for me, too. One, of which is, one set of which is ah. both necessary and eternal, and the other of which is... is Decidedly not eternal. Yeah, there's, a, there's an ongoing debate in, in uh, Thomas literature between, say, John Whipple and Norman Kretschmar um, over the question of whether Thomas has 
licensed himself on the basis of his claim that divine goodness is self-diffusive to speak of God's freely creating right. anything. Right. And I think Kretschmar wins this one hands down. I think Stump wins hands down. <laughs> you, won't, you won't find many Roman Catholic Thomistic scholars who would agree. <laughs> Not the ones I'm talking to, yeah. anyway. I mean, the real. The, let's come back to it. the real issue. Is God knows Himself perfectly. God knows what He will do before He does it. God knows what He will will before He wills it. So, He knows perfectly what He will will. How real can options be when he knows what he will will? If that's an eternal event in his, as, as a function of his own self-knowledge, how real can it be? Well, now all I'm doing here, and I haven't even gotten to the heart of my argument yet, but all I'm doing here is, is pulling out a thread. And the thread is one that you have too, exhaustive divine foreknowledge. We, we both agree on that. All I'm doing is playing with you at the moment. But I haven't gotten to the real main course yet. I recognize that. <laughs> um, I do, though, just um, on this same point, though, um, I will be interested to hear you make the connection between knowing and necessity. The, the, that is one of the most important points I made, and I'm going to hammer away at this, is you cannot use definitions acquired from contingent and necessary events in the created world to control the meaning of those terms and then apply them to a unique event without destroying its uniqueness. Well, they, ha it has, they have to be defined by the event itself, and we have to learn from what God is how they are appropriately used. In principle, uh, I don't think any, I certainly wouldn't have a problem with that. I will say at the same time that when we have terms like that, if they're going to be analogical at all and not merely equivocal, there is going to be some connection. If we, don't, if we don't allow God to teach us how properly to use the language, we wouldn't even know whether analogy is the right term to describe the results. Yeah. And I actually um, am a scotist on language as well, so there's going to be a, a further place for you to win yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I've been hanging out with the Dominicans for too long for that. Do we have further... <laughs> Questions we um, we have a lot to to ask about, so I'm sure we do. Can't wait to see you when you get warmed up. <laughs> May I ask a question about uh, reclaiming Protestantism, yeah, though? Um, you want to emphasize the importance of evangelicals holding on to Protestant core doctrines. And I share that. I also share your concern for the ontological deficit mm. in Protestantism. But you've, you also sketched what's happened to the mainline church. Yeah. So we're six years away from celebrating the 500th anniversary of your know, Luther's 95 Theses. Mm. Um, what's, where's the locus for this renewed Protestant theology? Is that, is that the term we should be going for? And if so, what is the constituency? Uh, as evangelicals, do you think we need to be talking about Protestantism, or is there a way of reclaiming the core commitments without the term? What strategically would you advise? I, I would hope that all of the evangelical seminaries in this country, of which this is one, would be such a locus. I, I would hope that places like this would do for the mainline churches what they seem incapable of doing for themselves. I would hope that your attention wouldn't be distracted by emergence on the one side and uh, evangelical Catholics on the other side, or like a snake that turns around and bites its tail by both together. Uh, I would hope that you remember that the Reformation was extremely important and that the challenge that it set forth has not been adequately addressed to this point. It's, it's simply being uh, shunted off into a side station. That's all. So, I mean, what can we do about it? I mean, you and I are in good positions to train ministers and uh, theologians of the future who hopefully will make a difference. Hi. Um, Jonathan Edwards in Freedom of the Will seems to make a similar argument to your previous discussion equating <clears throat> 
uh, God's knowing and willing that, mm-hmm. that certain things are implied in that. Uh, would I be correct in, in saying that, or how would you differentiate what he's doing with what you're arguing for on that point? I, I don't know Edwards well enough to answer your question. Um, ask me about almost anybody, and I probably have something to say, but Edwards was a lacuna in my education, and there was reasons for that. Part of it was expertise of people in my department, but part of it was because the 18th century was much less interesting to me than the 19th. Um, but I will say this, and th- this, is, this is what little I do know of Edwards. I, I think those who think that Edwards had a form of panentheism up and running were probably right. I think that uh, there are better ways to do what he was trying to do than what he did. Um, I think he was a transitional figure um, who stood between the earlier Reformed and, was, and were headed towards Schleiermacher, basically. And um, for my money, that's actually a pretty good place to wind up. Um, so if the worst thing that can be said about Edwards is that he's halfway to Schleiermacher, that's not a bad thing to say about anybody. Um, So I'm glad to hear he agrees with me. I feel better. All right. Well, um, it's been a wonderful evening, and we have uh, refreshments waiting to um, help us with our evening. Uh, let's join our uh, together and thank our speaker tonight. This is a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you.